So let's use that as a segue to jump into some of these medication classes. Um, so thank you for that nice segue. Um, you know, it, it seems to me when I'm looking at this that we have, you know, a, 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 a class of the short-acting bronchodilators, an example of that would be albuterol, but then we have three types of maintenance classes. So the LABAs, an example would be like salmuterol, the LAMAs where an example would be teotropium, and the inhaled corticosteroids where you might see fluticasone, right? And so what I'm curious about isn't so much how you look at those drugs individually, it's how you're, based on what you just said, the use of those in combination, where you see the use of those and, and where you think dual combination makes the most sense. Yeah. So the first most important point that I would like to get across to primary care providers and databases tell us that we have a lot of progress we need to make and that is COPD in, with rare exception should be treated with long-acting maintenance drugs, okay? Now, which of the two or three we're gonna have further discussion? But what that means is it's not an as-needed albuterol or as-needed combivent, okay? These drugs are, are gone in, in three to six hours, um, and patients rarely take enough to cover them throughout the day. And that impacts on not only their symptoms, but on exacerbation frequency. We have proven that long-acting inhalers, meaning twice a day or once a day, inhalers and the three classes are long-acting anti-muscarinic agents, LAMAs, long-acting beta agonists, LABAs, and inhaled corticosteroids in various combinations all have proven to decrease flare-ups which impact their lives and impact the cost of health care. So number one, long-acting bronchodilators. Everything else is nuance, important nuance, but that's climbing the mountain. Okay. I agree with what Frank says. I, you know, the, uh, there are, as, as, as Frank says, guidelines that are available to us, and there are nuances that differ between guidelines. Their overall approach is the same uh, the, with the concept that short-acting beta agonists, which are a mainstay in, in the treatment of asthma, for example, are not the mainstay in the treatment of COPD. COPD should be treated with maintenance therapies. You know, I think that uh, most of us uh, 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 start when in more mild disease with uh, the long-acting muscularinics that, uh, that, uh, that Frank was talking about. And gold suggests, tends to suggest that you start with one and add as you go. Uh, but, but that was, so that was my next question not, is, is that really what you're doing? I, I, you know, again, I think Frank and I do the same. If I've got a patient with significant disease and significant symptoms, I'm actually starting them on a llama and a lava at the same time. You know, I think the evidence are that, that those drugs are more effective than either of the agents alone, and thankfully there's no evidence that there is an increased risk of those agents alone. And the third group of drugs that we have, the ICS, the data suggests that's predominantly, if not completely, in those patients who have uh, more frequent exacerbations. So now, that was now, all of this may change as we go along. I mean, part of the problem is, you know, you know, we all understand that in many people, particularly with the airway disease, with the bronchitic component, that there is a major inflammatory component. In, uh, steroids may not ultimately be the best choice for that, inhaled corticosteroids. You so, know, and, and I, you know, so I think that these are things that we talk about, but I think that the mainstay of therapy are lamalabas, and then we add on from there. I assume you agree with that. Frank. So who, let me ask you a question as a, a, just a lowly internist here. So um, who gets the lava llamas and who gets the lavas with corticosteroids? Like which, which sort of types of patients end up on which therapies? So I would argue in COPD. So in asthma, I always say you, can, you lead with the inhaled corticosteroid to shut down, shut down the symptoms, and often those patients no longer have obstruction. They don't even need bronchodilators, except for, as Byron said, as needed, short-acting sure. uh, for symptoms. In COPD, they are irreversible, or they are incompletely reversible by definition, meaning that even when you maximally treat them, you can't completely reverse them. And that often is associated with also 
regardless of how well you treat them, you can improve symptoms, but you can't eliminate symptoms. So we lead with the long-acting bronchodilators. And Byron and I both feel um, similarly that in patients who often present, certainly to pulmonologists, but often even primary care docs, they're in the more moderate to severe stage. And you could slowly work your way up to maximal treatment, but in almost all cases, they're all gonna be on both the LABA and the LAMA. And so very often, we'll start the LABA and LAMA, okay? Which means that a LABA ICS is almost never the right thing to start, okay? Now, in somebody who has symptoms and are frequently exacerbating, or some of us are looking at eosinophil counts as a guidance, we'll go right with a LABA LAMA and the inhaled corticosteroid right out of the gates. But in almost all cases, we work our way up to LABA LAMA. That is fundamental to patients with moderate to severe disease with persistent symptoms across the board. The ICS, I'll let, I'll let Byron begin to describe the nuance when we want an ICS and when we don't want ICS, but I think the bronchodilators, maximally bronchodilated, is fundamental to all patients who have persistent symptoms. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. It's a, you know, and the interesting thing is that not only is the Lama Lava oftentimes very effective in the symptoms, uh, but there's evidence suggesting they're reasonably good for exacerbations as well. Uh, now, if you have someone with ongoing exacerbations, then you would think about adding the ICS component. And, uh, and if you have somebody with really quite severe disease, I would suggest many of us who have pathways in our hospitals on how to deal with it, I think that if you have someone who's been bad enough with bad enough disease to be hospitalized, you could make a pretty strong argument based upon some of the data existing now that they should be discharged on a triple, th on triple regimen. Okay. I mean, I think that that is a possibility. The only other thing I want to bring up, and I'm not trying to confuse anybody, but it, it does come up in primary care a lot, is the, com con is the confusing issue of, of an overlap between asthma and COPD and what is the difference between it. And I'm sure, Maria, you deal with this a lot from your standpoint. And it's complicated because from a primary care doctor, where even a, a pulmonologist has been in practice for many years like Frank and I have, it's sometimes not completely clear. Uh, and uh, that's a subset that primary care might look at and said, I don't know for sure what it is. I'll just, I know it's important to have an inhaled corticosteroid in the asthmatic population, so it's just easier for me to use that. That comes again to education and defining the nature of the diseases you're dealing with.